All right, if you'd open up your Bibles this evening, the passage for, well, the passage we'll begin exposition on is Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. We probably will only begin into Psalm 2 because there's a foundation to lay as we get into the book of Psalms itself. The, the last time as, as we finished the book of Job, there were some heavy themes that, that emerged. God's sovereignty over suffering. It is the reality that God calls his people to suffer. God, God appoints the suffering of his people for the declaration of his supreme sufficiency. As we saw with Job, the enemy, the tempter, had questioned the sufficiency of God's, uh, Job's love for God. Job said, the enemy said of Job, he only loves you because of the things and of, of his health. And the Lord says, I'll prove otherwise, and took those things from Job. And as we make that comparison, looking at, at Job's suffering and the sufferings of Christ as our example, our archetype, as, as we have seen in 1 Peter, it is, we come to the understanding that it is something that Christians should expect to suffer. It's spoken of freely within the New Testament. Jesus said, they'll hate you because they hated me. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulations and troubles. And the author of Hebrews tells us that we are to go outside the gate and suffer as he does. Uh, the, the, the Apostle Paul speaks often of fulfilling the, what was lacking in the sufferings of Christ and his suffering. We are called as examples. And this is a really stark contrast between the biblical reality and the mega millions, health and wealth, abominable prosperity gospel that's preached in many churches today. And unfortunately, even in churches that don't preach pure prosperity gospel, Jesus is often an add-on to an already existent life. You already have a house and a boat and a car and all of these things. Just add Jesus so you don't go to hell at the end of the day. But the, the scriptures are absolutely clear. Those who come after Christ are only worthy to be called Christ followers if they take up their cross and follow him. If they love anything more than him, anything at whatsoever, they are not worthy of him. Scripture calls us to carry our cross and die to ourselves, Matthew 16, to go outside the gate and bear reproach, Hebrews 13, 13, and that the message, the very message we come to the world with, which is life to us, it's the power of God and the gospel to us, is a stumbling block and foolish to those who are not being saved. Christians are often ridiculed in today's society. How can you possibly believe a book written to, uh, uh, 2,000 years ago by all these different people, um, don't you understand that science has progressed, that we know more now? How can you possibly believe the world's only 6,000 years old when those who understand the sufficiency of Scripture, the, 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 the revelation of God and its perfect perfections throughout, I, I would say that I don't, I don't think a, a single book within the volume of, the, of Scripture demonstrates that consistency more than the book of Psalms. It is a book written over a massive time frame by several different authors and has such a beautiful prophetic uh, consistency throughout. In the end, Christians expect suffering and they have the same comfort, the same hope that Job did. As Job spoke in in chapter 19, verse 25, he says that his Redeemer will stand on this earth and he will judge. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear that God has appointed a day on which that Redeemer will come and judge the world in righteousness and God proved it by raising him from the dead. Notice how the central hope of Job, thousands of years before Christ existed, rests on the same person that Paul proclaimed raised from the dead. There, the Redeemer that Job spoke of is none other than Christ. And it, for those who will repent, those who will turn to Christ and follow God's commandment to pr place their, their faith alone in Him for righteousness, will find comfort that one day He comes to set all things right. Those who do not will find comfort in this life, but none in the next. As we started this series back in... Genesis over a year ago, we started with the, the statement or the premise that all of 
the Bible points to Christ, either directly or indirectly. It doesn't matter where you are in the text, what, what book you start with, what page you start on. It's leading you to Christ. It's pointing to Him and His work. Now, that, that was our investigation. Let's go and explore this truth, this truth that all of Scripture is the redemptive story of God for His people. And as we get into the book of Psalms today, as, I've, um, as we'll mention more later, it's, the book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible. It is the most quoted book in the Bible. It's the most quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted something like 68 times in the New Testament by the different authors from Christ through the apostles. It is uh, a book that is uh, often overlooked in today's evangelical culture. And what do I mean by that? If you ask somebody in your church as a pastor, I have asked this question on many occasions, what book would you like to study? One of the last books to be asked about is the book of Psalms. Sometimes it's Genesis. I want to know about creation in the six days. Sometimes it's the book of Revelation. I want to know about what's going to happen. But very rarely is the book of Psalms the central study. And that is, that is a pity because this book is something special within the Old Testament. It's something that stands out from all of the other books. So as we approach the book of Psalms, there is a, uh, there is a, a need to understand the, the special nature of the book as we approach it. It is the, the hymnal, if you will, of heaven. It is the, the book of worship of God's people. And in order to approach the book of Psalms well, we need to start with Genesis. What do I mean by that? Well, over the last year, we've gone through, and I'm, I'm going to go through a list of, some of, the, of the, some of the things we've touched on over the last year, and consistently been brought back to our need for Christ. For example, in Genesis, we started with the Proto-Evangelium. This is the first gospel, right? And Adam and Eve have just fallen. There's, they, they've, they've lost relationship with God. How can this relationship be restored? And God promises the one who will crush the serpent's head. The, they... Eve looked for this promise in her lifetime. When, when Abel was, when Cain was born, she said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Surely this is the Redeemer that God was talking about. And then we know Cain murdered his brother, and Abel and Cain were dead, and Seth is born, and the, the answer to him is, look, here, the, here's another one, a promise from God. That, that line follows down, and we got to the patriarchs, and we talked about the promises to Abraham Isaac and Jacob, and each one of those men, the Lord appeared to them personally and said, in your seed, the world will be blessed. In your line, I will bless the entire world. In the very beginning of the story, we had a, a, a dire need for a redeemer, a, a, a savior, and that promise continued. As we got into the book of Exodus, there was the revelation of the divine name. God said, I am. The application of God as I am is infinite because He is infinite. When God said He is, there's nothing He's not. He is all-sufficient. He is justice. He is mercy. He is love. He is everything. But for the people of God, there's a special application. And that special application is in Christ. In Christ, God is every bit the Redeemer that His people need. When he sends Christ, Christ's work is sufficient. Christ can stand before the throne and say, Father, I am their righteousness. I am their Redeemer. Further on in Exodus, we saw the necessity of the shedding of blood as the Passover story plays out. And God is redeeming his people. He's, he's writing the story of a picture of what Christ will do later for his elect in, in, in the spiritual realm. He is redeeming his people out of the uh, land of Egypt, out of death. And the avenging angel, the wrath of God is coming down on those that have rebelled. And only those under the blood of the Lamb. With the, with the blood on the doorposts and, and the lintel of the door, were saved from the wrath, the avenging wrath of God. Those who did not come under this 
the blood of this lamb were dead, the firstborn of all the house of Egypt. God's amazing proclamation continues as he takes his people out of the land of Egypt and he says, he says to them, now here are my commandments. And we know the, the, the most famous of those commandments are the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. And at the beginning of the Decalogue, as, as, as the Lord's beginning to give these commandments, he says, I am the God who's faithful. I am faithful and forgiving and kind to the thousand generations of those who love me and are called by my name. But it, also a just God who does not pardon the iniquity and visits the iniquity of the fathers on the sons to the fourth generation. How are these two things possible? How can, how can uh, uh, a just God say, I will be um, kind, gracious, giving, protecting to thousands of generations for those that love me, and I will not pardon the guilty and have any human not look at themselves and go, I'm in the guilty camp. I'm in the camp where God says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. And we come to the question that will run through all of Scripture, the same question we saw in Ezra and Nehemiah. How can a just God punish, uh, not punish, a wicked person? And the answer is those blessings are received in Christ. In Christ, God is the justifier of those who believe in Him. Leviticus is a book often uh, found dry by readers. There are many, many instructions. The instructions to the priests is what we looked at in Leviticus. And over and over again, God specified right down to the, to the amount of food they should eat, when they should eat it, what they should dress in, very, very specifically defining His worship. The overarching understanding is that God gets to define how He's worshiped, not man. This has vast implications for our modern forms of uh, evangelical worship that, that run off into uh, emotionalism rather than staying centered on Scripture. But the overarching understanding was that these priests had to perform these duties day in and day out without failure, over and over and over again, and that they couldn't do that. This is why that the blood was sprinkled on Aaron and his sons, and before Aaron could ever enter the Holy of Holies once a year, atonement had to be made for him before he could go and make atonement for the people. But there is a king and a priest who can shoulder that duty. There is one whose, whose worship of God is perfect, and in him our worship is perfected. The, the dry instructions... Light the fire at this time. Keep the fire burning at that time. Put the bread on this table, but make sure it's not out there for over a day. Eat half of the, the cakes in the morning and half of the cakes in the evening. All of these specific instructions that if read through the, uh, uh, the self-centered eyes do seem dry. When, when read through the eyes of those searching for the perfections of Christ, they point only to Him the priest, the king that is Christ. That we're, we're only into numbers. In, numbers. in the book of Numbers, we again explored the, the perfection of God and the, the requirements for righteousness that God has revealed in the Nazarite vow. In the Nazarite vow, the, the person is to set themselves completely apart from the world. They can't approach a dead person, even their relative. They cannot, they, they cannot cut their hair. They can't have anything of, of grape juice. They are fully set apart to, where the, the, to the point where they have to walk on the other side of the street when people come by on, because they may, be, uh, they may break their vow and have to start all over again. As we meditated on the level of righteousness required in just this one little vow to be holy and set apart for God, it illuminates our understanding of the, 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 the implications of the vast statement we're making when we call ourselves a people set apart for God. The, 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 the instructions for the Nazarite vow, right? there's five or six specific instructions and they seem so very hard. They seem uh, difficult to accomplish. But to be set apart for God means to be holy. It means to be able to perfectly do all of God's commandments. When we examine these things, we 
are only left with the understanding of how short we fall, of how far from righteousness we are. And this call to righteousness, and again, what is the, what is the, 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 the answer? Over and over again. Notice, we've, we've gone from Genesis, Exodus, we're in Numbers now. The answer is still Christ. The answer, the answer is Christ in every part of Scripture. When we, talk, when we took a look at the Aaronic blessing in Numbers 6, and it said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and give you peace. These, these words that God said to the Aaronic priesthood, you will use this blessing to bless my people. And again, we come back to that problem. How can God bless the wicked? How can God bless those that are unrighteous and be just? And again, the gospel is in the blessing. God lifts his face up and his countenance shines upon his people because of the work of Jesus Christ. And we looked at why God chose a serpent to represent Christ on a pole. As Christ told Nicodemus, that as the serpent was raised up in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be raised up. Christ made the connection for us as we followed that thread to Christ. The, the, the necessity of looking on someone or something in faith and how even that faith can be turned into idol worship as that symbol was destroyed later by King Hezekiah because people were worshiping it. Probably one of the toughest books we went through was Deuteronomy. The blessings and the cursings. The prophetic word of Moses that said, when you return, not, not if you get cursed, if you don't follow the ways of God. Moses was like, no, I know you people. You're, you're not going to follow God. You're going to, to fall under these curses. You're going to be exiled. And when you return, again, what is the catalyst for that return? It's the same one that we talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah when we get there. Joshua, direct reference to Christ, the commander of the armies of the Lord. He stands before Joshua and he says, I lead the armies of the Lord. The parable of Jericho, the city of destruction that we all live in, that the only one saved is the one that surrendered to the king. The one that said, I can't win this battle. Those who stood on the ramparts, those who defended their city, they, they fell when the walls fell and they were destroyed. But Rahab, who surrendered, who said, you represent God. You, will you show mercy on me? They were saved. All of us exist in a parable of Jericho. We live in the city of destruction and only by surrendering to the king and his army and his commandments can we be saved. And then the cities of refuge that Joshua put in place. How the, the person accused of, of wrongdoing could only be pardoned at the death of the high priest. It is one of those direct references to Jesus Christ in, in the text of Scripture. Why the death of the high priest? Because only the death of the high priest can atone for sins. The book of Judges is a complete mess. It is the picture of what happens when men don't follow the instructions of the Lord, when they don't obey. It, one of the best ways to, to sum up the book of Judges is to say this is what it looks like when everyone does what is right in their own eyes. We know the, the many atrocities that happened and the, the time and time again that God was faithful to His people even though He had the right from the very beginning, even in the time of Joshua, to bring those curses that we read about in Deuteronomy. They had run off to worship other gods, as we saw with Micah and his golden image. They had run away from the, uh, the worship of God. There was infighting. There was uh, rebellion against his commandments. There was no following of the, the word of God. And yet, over and over and over again, even in such darkness, such evil, God protected his people. He raised up judges, after, one after another, who would run off the enemy over and over and over again. Finally, the people completely rebelled from the lordship of God and told Samuel, give us a king. We know the story of Samuel as, as he ruled righteously, as he led righteously, even as Eli had in his lifetime, but their sons had been wicked. The only sure house, the one promise that, that the Lord spoke to Samuel about, the one he would raise up that had a sure house, is Christ. Christ is the one who rules and never fails in His ruling because He is eternal. 
Furthermore, we saw the contrast between the good and evil king. In Samuel 8, the king that will take everything that you have. In the end of 2 Samuel, the king who is the sun and the light and the provision for his people. The, the wonder for his people. The, the, the sun and the rain. The, the life-giving water and the sunshine that gives the energy. The, the, the picture that God spoke to Solomon through David of the righteous king and what God does through him. And, and the only conclusion, again, is Christ is that victor. Another picture we saw in First and Second Samuel in, in, is the picture of, of the evil and the righteous king in battle. Saul hid in his tent and let the shepherd boy go out and fight the enemies of the living God. And that shepherd boy, armed with nothing but a stone, stood in front of a giant. And he slew that giant. And we understand that Christ is victor. Christ has slain the giant that is death and sin. Christ has overcome the, the giant that nobody else could. The whole army, every one of them cowered in fear because they knew they could not beat this man. David went out in the power of the Lord and won. All of us have cowered in fear before sin and death. There is no overcoming this enemy for us, but our king has overcome this enemy. An evil king sends his, his soldiers to war for him. A righteous king leads that, those fights himself. We saw later in 2 Samuel how David, when he failed to go lead the army, fell into great sin. In the story of David and Bathsheba, David Instead of going to lead the army, stayed home. And we know the results of that, uh, of that decision. We also know that David was redeemed, was forgiven. And that when he prayed in Psalm 51, to restore to me the joy of my salvation, the Lord did so. And he did so through the one king that had already won the victory for David. First and second Kings starts out with Samuel, or uh, Solomon's zeal for the Lord. He's building the house of God. He's sacrificing thousands of animals at the high place in Gibeah. But as we examine Solomon's life, we realize that even the slightest off trajectory of worship of the Lord, even the, the slightest failure to worship as God has, has lasting repercussions. Solomon started out with love for the Lord, sacrificing to the Lord at Gibeah. And before the end of his life, in the same place where he was sacrificing to the Lord, he was also sacrificing to all the other gods, little g. Now there is some debate as to whether Solomon repented before the end of his life. I think there's solid cases to make on either one of those. But the principle that the Lord reveals through, the, through his revelation. Bring me two more. The principle that the Lord reveals through his revelation is that only the perfect leader, only the one who can keep the trajectory, is the one who can be the righteous king. Are we on again? Okay, technical difficulties resolved. All right, so when speaking of Solomon, what the life of Solomon teaches us is that you can have all of the wisdom and all of the, the, the wealth in the world, but if your trajectory and worship of God is off, then you will be destroyed. Christ the King, His trajectory is never off. So that when we worship through Him, when we worship through God, uh, through Christ to God, it is always right. Moreover, as we looked at the story of Solomon and how Rehoboam, his son, was a wicked king, the, the trajectory that, that the, the parents start matters very much. The, 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 par the trajectory of the leader matters much for the country, as Judah would over and over again fall into evil following Solomon's reign. God restrained that evil, we watched, as God would raise up good king after good king, while the other ten tribes of Israel just went downhill over and over and over again. There never seemed to be a reprieve. Even in, even in the one king in, in the, 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 
the northern tribes that might have been called a good king, Jehu, there was never an overturning of the, the original sin, the, the calves, the golden calves that were set up at the beginning of Israel's trajectory. We saw two very different trajectories as one part of the nation descended into the most evil kinds of idol worship. And the other, God raised up good king after good king that would reset the playing field, that would put things right until finally Manasseh comes on the scene and he practices the most vile things right in the temple of God. And we see that God has released his hand. He is not, he's no longer holding back the evil and he brings righteous judgment for that. God's evil was restrained and um, we'll see more of, the, of how God does that when we get into Ezekiel. Getting more close to where we've just been in Ezra and Nehemiah, and and bear with me, I know I'm rehashing a lot of what we've already said, but there's a point to this. In Ezra and Nehemiah, the scriptures talk about the iniquities that have gone above our heads. We're presented with the very same problem we had back in Exodus, the very same problem we've had all along. No human meets God's standard. We We don't just not meet God's standard by a little bit. We we revel in iniquity. It, it rises above our heads. We, we swim in it so much so that we don't even know how much of it we do. We've talked many times here about the, the commandment that thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said this is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said on these two, hang all the law and the prophets. Yet, we have failed to keep those commandments carefully. We we talk about iniquity going above our heads. We wake up in the morning and we're groggy and we're uncomfortable and we need to go to the bathroom. And in in the... the, uh, curt word we say to our, our wife as, as we're going out the door or the, or the, uh, the uh, grumpiness about this pain or that pain, we forget that in that moment we are not loving God with all of our hearts. We are, we, we are so normalized to our daily life that we forget every moment how important it is to, to keep God first. We, we live in a state of less than perfection, of less than holiness, of iniquity, of breaking God's commandments. And again, the only solution is Jesus Christ. Ezra and Nehemiah confess with the people, Lord, we've married out of the, out of the, the, the nation, as you've told us not to. We haven't kept this commandment or that commandment. And Ezra brings a copy of the word of God and he stands in front of the people and he reads it and their response is, Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Ezra said, we've been slaves up until now, Lord, and, and our iniquity has gone above our heads, but please don't consider what we've gone through light. How can God be just and justify the sinners? It points us to Christ, the necessity of Christ. In Esther, we saw a picture of God's sovereignty and protection, even when the people didn't know it. How many people understood all the intricacies that brought Esther to that place in time? How many people understood the the full salvation of what God did through Esther? Few, but... Even when we don't know it, even when there's, uh, there is uh, circumstances going on in the world around us that we have no idea of, God's faithfulness happens within those circumstances. Esther was used by God to preserve the line of Christ, to preserve the, the people of God, to, to bring about the, the return to Jerusalem. And in, so in the days of Esther, God demonstrate, he demonstrated he was in control. And that same control, that same sovereignty crushed Christ on the cross. Just as God worked and used Esther to, to preserve his people, God brought Christ to that time, born of that virgin at that place in time for the purpose of crushing him for our iniquity as we see in Isaiah 53, it pleased God to crush him. He laid our iniquity on him for our, he was bruised for our iniquities. 
It points to Christ. Even in a, even in a book that it never mentions the word God once. God is working. God is telling his story of his redemption of his people. Now, what I hope to have brought to the forefront as we talked about this. We're coming to the book of Psalms. Everything that has led us up to this point should exalt Christ in our mind. Moment by moment, day by day, we should come to this and go, wow. From the very beginning, Christ in the, in the Exodus, Christ in Numbers, Christ in Samuel, Christ in Esther, Christ. It all points us to Christ and should lead us to a point where we approach the book of Psalms with an attitude of worship. It's actually five books. And we're going to spend time in each of those five books as we go forward, but I hope we can keep that attitude of worship as we proceed through the book. And why, why is that important? Well, the, the book of Psalms is the worship of God's people. It is the record of the worship of God's people. It is the pure worship of God uh, in, in the Scriptures. It is the God-ordained worship of Himself. It not only teaches, it not only reproves and corrects, it not only strengthens and edifies, but it is a book that stands as the gateway to worship. The Psalms ask who can approach the hill of God. Who can approach the hill of God? What is the, what is the question? Who can worship God? Who can go up to Mount Zion that sits on the hill and worship God truly? And the answer is he who has clean hands. All of the demonstration of our need for Christ over and over and over, over the last year, should bring us to answer that question only one way. Only in Christ can I have clean hands to worship God. I hope, again, that we can keep the attitude of worship as we go out throughout the whole book of Psalms. The question I would ask is, if we'd ask ourselves this, I have to ask myself this on a daily basis. Something Pastor Washer says, Often is Christian, preach the gospel to yourself. Why does he say that? Because we become, we become slow. We become gathered in what we're doing. I, I do it on a regular basis. I get up in the morning. I get through my, my devotional time. I do my Bible reading. I do my prayer. And I close the, the program. I take a sip of my coffee. And I'm off and running. And the next thing I know, it's 4 p.m. And I've, I have spent no time meditating on those things and finding those things valuable to myself. Even though I start the day right, when I start the day right, I still need to ask myself that question. What does the gospel mean to me? Another way to ask the question is if I really believe all of the revelation of, of Christ that we have seen over the last year, what attitude should that bring me to? This is the attitude that we must approach the book of Psalms with. We must approach the book of Psalms with this attitude of worship, with this question in our minds. If Christ is all of these things, if he is the center of all creation, and this book is about worshiping him and about him, what does this bring me to? As I already mentioned, this is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. And I, I, I don't want to seem as if you know, here's Pastor Aaron telling you that the, the book of Psalms is, is so important and, and so serious. This is not only my idea. I share this quote from Calvin just to simply show that, that those who have, have dived, delved into this book will tell you it contains treasures that are not easy to express. Calvin wrote in his commentary introductory to Psalms, the varied and resplendent riches which are contained in this treasury is no easy matter to express in words. So much so that we'll know that whatever I shall be able to say will be far from approaching the excellency of the subject. I feel the same way as Calvin. When diving into the Psalms, when soaking up the incredible, rich 
theology of the people of God, worshiping God, prophesying in the Spirit of God in a poetic form. And poetry can communicate on a level deeper than simply using words. Poetry is intended to communicate larger images. For example, there's a poem called Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I memorized it when I was a kid. And there's a scene in it where it says, And with muffled oar he silently rowed to the Charleston shore, just as the moon rose over the bay where swinging wide at her moorings lay the Somerset, British man of war, a phantom ship with each mast and spar across the moon like a prison bar and a huge black hulk magnified by its own reflection in the tide. Wadsworth, Henry Wadsworth takes you there and he makes the scene come alive in the rhyme. As you can hear, almost hear the creaking of the wood and the, the oars and the, uh, the, the masts across the moon and the, the impending doom of this man of war ship with th a thousand British soldiers on it as Paul Revere slips across the river to spread the alarm. The book of Psalms does the same for our worship of God. It brings us into the very presence of God and informs our worship in a, in a very special way in Scripture. So hopefully I've whetted your appetite for Psalm 2. Let's read Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12 in preparation for diving into it next week. Why do the heathens rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their courts from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will tell the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations, uh, give you the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish from the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. The book of Psalms is a much debated book. It's a book written over a thousand years. Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses, while several of the psalms that make up the, the last part of the book are attributed to those that are during the exile. We're talking a thousand, more than a thousand years in period. When examining the book, when considering what we're looking at, the, the, there have been many theories ventured. Why are there five books within psalms? Some have said, well, they tie to the five books of the Pentateuch. I can see where you get that. Um, there, the, the opinions are varied about, the, about why there were these five books, but one thing we can find within those books is themes, themes that exist within each, each seg segment, things that overlap from time to time, but point to the same issues and provide different answers to those solutions. Not different answers that are contradictory, but different perspectives. For example, the book one points to the inauguration of the Davidic covenant, and we know that points forward to Christ as he is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Book two is the continuation of the line of the kings, the, the promise of the, the, the uh, redemption of, of God's people, the, 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 but beginning to get into the, the theme of suffering, as book three does. Book three addresses the suffering of, God, of the people of God. And book four talks about how the king will overcome that suffering. Again, pointing forward to Christ. And finally, book five, as R.C. Sproul puts it, calls for obedience that focuses on the true worship of God. The reason these are important, 
The reason we're bringing these things up is because they are the context, that they're a part of the context for exegeting, for being in the psalm. So when we begin to examine Psalm 2 next week, the question we'll have to ask ourselves, well, this is in the book of proclaiming the Davidic kingship. What king are we talking about? I enjoyed Calvin's comment on this subject as he was writing on Psalm 2. He said, but it is now high time we come to the substance of the type. David prophesied concerning Christ. That David prophesied concerning Christ is clearly manifested from this, that he knew his own kingdom to be merely a shadow. And in order to learn to apply Christ to, uh, to, apply to Christ whatever, whatever David in past times sang concerning himself, we must hold this principle, which we meet with everywhere in the prophets, that he, David, with his prosperity, was made king, not so much for his own sake, but to be a type of the Redeemer. Calvin gives us the application. Remember, I've said we need to press in to the book of Psalms and let it inform our worship. Calvin says this. He says, this should lead us. This leads us to place our faith beyond the reach of cavils. I never heard that word before. It means make uh, the making of petty or unnecessary objections. I, I like it. I think I'm going to keep that word. But Calvin says, this, the, the reality of Christ revealed in the Psalms should bring us, especially as we're talking here about Psalm 2, beyond any petty or unnecessary objections to our faith. It, it should bring us be honest because, as Calvin says, it is plainly made manifest from all the prophets that those things which David testified concerning his, whole, his own kingdom are properly applicable to Christ. So in conclusion, we'll look at things, the things concerning faith and place, that place our faith beyond the reach of cavils, as Calvin mentioned, next time. This evening, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.